can you just check the chat functions, Jeff? Um, so Bruce, I'm going to let you take this away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning for the session two of our Sherpa Snack in our six pack series. Uh, we're gonna talk about lighting revolutions today. Uh, last week, we were just basically, uh, for those of you that missed it, we were talking about all the reasons why um, getting into lighting is, is challenging and is difficult and all the roadblocks that you'll probably encounter as you step into uh, this new category. So I did that to help prepare you for um, some of the some of the turbulence that you might um, come across as you're trying to reach cruising altitude in this channel. Uh, but today, hopefully, this will be something that we set before you that will actually inspire you and excite you to to say that you know what the roadblocks that I'll have to go past is are worth it because what I'm delivering uh, to people is definitely part of this revolution. And I'm revolutionary and I want to do that. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and, and, and start in on this thing and, and talk about uh, Viva la Revolucion. We want to give you a revolutionary mindset today as it relates to uh, what is happening in the world of lighting. Um, two, two caveats before we start. The first one is, um, for those of you that don't know, um, Jungle Cruise came out a little while ago. Uh, we purchased it through Disney+. Plus. I've watched the movie twice. Dwayne Johnson's amazing. And one of the things that he does in the movie, if you haven't seen it, is he drops all kinds of, of terrible and horrible um, dad jokes. Uh, and and, and I, I love the dad jokes. So you might hear a few dad jokes throughout the day. Uh, just, just please try to, to choke back whatever, whatever uh, <laughs> vomit is in your mouth um, from that. So that's the one thing. Um, I'm going to drop a few dad jokes in the presentation today. The second is... Um, I, I love words. I love the meaning of words. And since we started last week by talking about the definition of what is a roadblock, we're going to continue that throughout the Snack in Our series to really dig into the essence of these words. I think sometimes we, we don't understand the full meaning of a word without really unpacking it. And I want to apply the word revolution and help you understand why it is absolutely appropriate to use in reference to lighting. Uh, so what is a revolution? It's a noun. It's a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. Okay, so uh, I want you to think about the overthrow of an old order as it relates to a, a new system that's coming on, on, on the scene that you all have an opportunity to be a part of. It's also an instance of revolving. So just as the earth is revolving around the sun, um, there is a turning that's happening in the lighting industry um, and, and I want to bring that to your attention today as we kind of dig into some things here. So, of course, with all things lighting, we have to start at the beginning. Um, first words of, of, uh, of the, the Hebrew Bible is let there be light um, as, as far as an act of creation. Uh, whether you're a big bang person or a big banger person, um, regardless, there's a tremendous amount of energy that was released in the form of light. Um, light is the only constant in Einstein's general theory of relativity. The, the substance of everything that we experience is, is relegated uh, to um, uh, some kind of relationship to light. Um, it is a cosmic archetypal force that we have to reckon with uh, that most people, even after studying it for their entire lives, are still just scratching the surface of. But that's where we have to begin, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's just do a, a brief history of residential lighting design through the ages, according to Bruce Clark. Um, so first, the first thing that people designed with back in the day was the sun. It was a very consistent, but yet unreliable uh, device. You just had to respond to it rather than it responding to you. Um, and eventually they de de developed fire, were able to bring the light inside their caves. And one, one guy was brave enough to pick up a stick with fire on it. He's like, hey, I can carry the fire with me in a torch. Uh, and then while they're cooking all of their buffalo over the fire, all the fat would start to, to, to flare up the fire. So like, hey, let's capture that and let's cook that and turn that into to light. And let's use fibers now as we dip it into wax and use candle power. Uh, let's use oil then and, and bring that into lamps. And eventually you're seeing that there's a progression of using materials and, and whatnot as individuals are bringing different kinds of light into their home. The incandescent was a significant shift in that entire um, economy and equation of bringing light into homes where electricity and illumination uh, were combined to help provide uh, light in a home. 
Um, and then as that evolved, the halogen lamp and the, in, the fluorescent bulb, and then uh, some of the initial white LED bulbs. And, and now we have something that we call the spectrum, uh, which, is, which is not even a light bulb. It's something more than that. But let, let's, let's look at what was actually powering the illumination back in the day. Um, what, was, what was the source of the fuel? Well, at the beginning, it was star power, right? Uh, and then we moved into wood power and then fat power and then fiber power and then oil power, gas power. And now we've been in the age of electric power and understanding more fully what electricity and electric power can provide for us in the area of illumination. Um, in that context, um, the electricity is being used to pass through a medium. What is that medium? What is the, what's the element that's being excited by that energy source? Well, it was the tungsten filament back in the day with the, the incandescent bulb. It would incandesce and emit light. Uh, in in the, the, uh, the, the technical term of that is in photons. Um, and then they realized, what if we were to put a special argon gas and allow that tungsten to be recycled back onto the filament? So they had the halogen. It was a re excited filament. Then with the, with the fluorescent, there was a phosphor on the inside that was excited to glow. Um, it was kind of like a regression by going to the compact fluorescent light because the quality of light, the functionality of it uh, just made a lot of people angry and frustrated. I think that's led to our current um, state of, of things in the world today. It was a CFL. Um, excited semiconductors are the, are the, the, the foundation of, of what the electricity is passing through for LEDs. And now we have more complex arrays of semiconductors being used in conjunction with one another to bring us into this, what I'm calling a lighting revolution. We are moving beyond the bulb. Um, I said in the last uh, snack in our uh, message of the session, uh, that, that we have a bulb uh, mentality for a lot of individuals. I, I was just at the, the hardware store this morning, saw a guy with, a, with one of those old nasty six inch cans and inside was a, was a screw socket for a light bulb. Uh, you don't see any screw sockets in this. We are moved beyond that. And, and I think that requires a shift of our paradigm thinking to understand what we're actually delivering to the market is something that's definitely beyond the bulb. <clears throat> but in order to understand what it is, we need to have a little anatomy leadson, okay? Sorry. We're gonna ask, what is an LED? I think that's a fundamental question. You know, we talk about LED technology, but do we really understand what is an LED? Well, I got the answer for you right here, all thanks to my friends at Wikipedia. An LED is a light emitting diode. It's a semiconductor light source that emits light when current flows through it. Electrons in the semiconductor recombine with electron holes, releasing energy in the form of photons. The color of the light corresponding to the energy of the photons is determined by the energy required for the electrons to cross the band gap of the semiconductor. White light is obtained by using multiple semiconductors or a layer of light emitting phosphor on the semiconductor device. Did you catch all that? I didn't think so, neither did I. Let's go ahead and break that down and just show you what a very simple looking LED is at, in, its, in its essence. Let there be light, okay? Cue the groans. First, uh, in an LED, they have the post, then they have something called an anvil. Then they drop in this little reflective cavity in the top of the anvil, put the little tiny piece of metal in the semiconductor die in there, connect a gold wire bond between the two of them, encase the entire thing in epoxy for preservation and, and, and safety. Um, and you know, similar to how a light bulb functions. And let's go ahead and, and power it up, bring the energy up the anode, down the cathode, and boom, light is emitted from the diode. Um, as the diodes were, were being um, invented, first it started with the red, and then the green came on the scene like, hey, this is kind of cool. We got red, we got green. Oh, now we have blue. Let's go ahead and throw it into TVs. And maybe we can combine those three elements together to make white. Oh, let's do RG and B together to form white. And I don't know if you were ever under any RGB lights back in the day, but um, that white that came out of it was not all that good. And so they realized that there were some limitations to that. So they decided, let's go ahead and say, you know, the white was just not quite right. Let's see if we can do something else with that. So what did they do to, to really improve and increase not only the efficiency of the LED, but also help bring the right kind of white? Uh, well, they found out that the blue LED um, was a pretty efficient and powerful emitter of light. Uh, so they decided, let's go ahead and do this. So the most common method 
They combine the blue LED with a yellow phosphor, producing a narrow range of blue wavelengths and a broad band of yellow wavelengths, which actually covers the spectrum of red to green, because if you mix red to green, of course, everyone knows that you get yellow. This type has surpassed the performance of trichromatic LEDs or RGB. The phosphors used in white light LED can give correlated color temperatures in the range of 2200K dimmed and incandescent up to 7000K daylight or more. Did you catch all that? Yeah, right. I didn't either. So let's go ahead and just bring this down in a quick little diagram. Like what, this is an example of kind of what it can look like um, in one application. Uh, but, but here's just some of the, the kit of parts that com comes together for this particular um, LED. First, you have your, your base. You drop in a heat sink to draw heat away from the surface. You have a silicone mount. They drop the diode. They put a phosphor coating on top. They put a silicone coating over all of that. Then they connect their gold wires. Um, then they have their, their anode lead and their cathode lead on the other end. And then they put an optic lens so that they can actually shape and, and, and protect that light as it's being emitted. So they say, let's take it up a notch here with this white um, type of LED. And depending on the phosphor coating that they put on, allows them to dial up or dial down the amount of whiteness to that light. So that looks more like maybe daylight on the higher end of the spectrum and maybe on the lower end of the spectrum, um, it's more kind of amber colored um, light, sort of like honey, right? So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the evidence that's brought to the idea of white LEDs as they're moving forward. But beyond the bulb again, as we're looking at this particular fixture, um, this is not just an LED bulb. This, let's look under the hood, shall we? And see what's going on. First, you have the IC rated housing. So that's a large black box with uh, the, the bars on there to connect it to the, to the um, joists of the ceiling. Then you have an adjustable light engine that not only rotates, but it also is angled so that you can uh, aim the light and, and put it wherever you want to, which is great for our dynamic lives under the ceiling. Uh, we don't live static lives. Um, then they have an interface, this driver plus wireless control for this particular device allows them to actually uh, deliver the right uh, kind of energy to the light source and also control that light source wirelessly rather than through a wired connection. Then you have the RGBW light emitter, R being red, G being green, B being blue, and W being white, um, or that, that blue covered with that phosphor coating, um, all blending together. Then they have an optic to help shape that light. Then they put a lens on there to help dissipate or, or bring that light to uh, soften it or harden it, depending on what you wanna do, or maybe they have, uh, they want to do a wall wash, whatever. You can do that with that particular lens. Then you have a trim to give it a kind of look and feel like this is what most people see under the ceiling. They don't realize all the stuff that's going on up above the ceiling for that particular device. And clearly, this is not just something that you just stick in and pull out. This is something that's integrated within the fabric of the constructed environment. It's as integrated into the construction as the HVAC system, as the plumbing any of those kind of things. And, and that's a shift in people's mentality as it relates to understanding that this is a piece of technology that's gonna be with them for a long period of time. But one thing I found out that's even more interesting um, is that with these particular uh, device that Ketra uses, uh, I refer to this as diodoku, like where they have the diodes, but it's in a Sudoku fashion where no row and no column has any duplication of any one of those colored diodes. So if you look across, you have green, blue, yellow, red. Uh, then you have green, blue, red, yellow down here. There's nothing that's repeated in either horizontal or, or vertical, which allows you then to create, um, you know, when the light is being mixed through all of these lighting up to varying degrees, it allows you not to have any part of it that looks like it's favoring one color over another. So you get a, a nice even uh, mixture of color that's being emitted from that particular diudoku, um, if I said that correctly, forgive me. Um, but, but how does that actually work? The, the demonstration of the, this, this, this LED within the process, every single LED, every single LED device is low voltage. Um, and what ends up happening then in order for us to make that work uh, back in the day when Thomas Edison and, and uh, Nikola Tesla were fighting with, other, with one another, Thomas Edison loved the AC voltage on the higher end. Uh, Tesla liked the low voltage. The LED requires low voltage. And so 
for to maintain its functionality. And so we, we have the conversion of power that's happening um, from the line voltage to the low voltage side uh, within some of the LED bulbs that's all happening within the base of the bulb, which usually causes that bulb to be longer than most bulbs because all of that driver technology and low voltage uh, transformation is happening within that base. And so um, even Ketra bulbs, if you look at some of them, it, it, it may be a little bit longer than the average bulb simply because of all of that stuff that's being stuck right into the base of that bulb before you have the traditional bulb shape that's coming out from an A lamp on the other end there. So the conversion happens there and that, that's how all LEDs function. And so anywhere within this um, configuration um, was where you can have a potential fail point and how that's gonna work, uh, where the driver um, has a certain kind of language and certain kind of technological uh, you know, inner workings um, that can also be a fail point as, as you move forward. But we're going to we'll talk a little bit about this as we move on, okay? With LEDs, there are some cons, there are some pros. Most of the time, people have one point of comparison for LEDs by the mo for the most part, and that's the traditional commodity lighting that has been done for, for ages. And that is the fluorescent, uh, but more so it's the incandescent. What can the LED do that the incandescent can't do? And what can the incandescent do that the LED can't do? Um, I always think it's good to start with the cons because then you can end up with the pros on the other end and, and feel a little bit better about yourself and the results. So what are the six cons that are worth considering? Um, it's not that these are, are things that you just want to say, well, because we have the con, let's just do away with it. Let's just consider it knowing that there are these potential pitfalls. So that way, when we're making recommendations to clients and whatnot about what light they should have, we're either able to draw their attention in a negative way to their current paradigm of using uh, substandard subpar sources that may fall into these six categories um, and then steer them up towards the things that we think would be really helpful for them. Uh, the first one is uh, LEDs typically tend towards a bluish wavelength of light. Um, going back to that whole blue LED diode thing, um, the blue um, is, is inherent within it, uh, which is why if you, if you ever are doing any sort of surfing on one of these things late at night, um, they actually have a night shift function on your smart device uh, because they know that blue light and the blue wavelength of light that hits your eye can actually jumpstart your system similar to if you're just drinking a cup of coffee. So late at night, if you're like really struggling, um, and, and you need to wake up, I'd say just, just crack open your phone, take off the light shift and play a round of Candy Crush on your smart device. And that'll give you the same kind of stimulus that you'd have from a cup of coffee. Um, another thing that can happen with LEDs, especially when you're in the static white area, is the only thing if you wanna to dim that or increase the brightness, you're limited to that one diode under that one phosphor, and you're limited to that range of the intensity of light on that one color. And so what ends up happening with certain uh, lamps is that when you dim them, the light actually looks grayish as it's getting down. It doesn't function the way an incandescent does where it actually turns color a little bit more in the amber color, uh, which is why there's more uh, dim to warm or warm dimming uh, lights that are out there on the market now. But be aware that static white fixtures typically look gray when you dim them down. And that's, that's something to, to consider. Uh, other things that can happen uh, because of the, the power conversion that's happening, if that isn't done properly and you have a mismatch, you can get something called flicker. Um, or you know, even dimming itself, it happens it very rapidly. And so your eye can't perceive that it's happening. But sometimes if you take photographs where there's LEDs that are in motion, you may actually see a little bit of a strobing effect. Um, but the flicker can happen. I actually had some, some clients where we installed some LED um, track lighting and the electrician had not wired it up properly so that when you went to even turn it on or try to dim it, it was like, boop, 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 and it was, and you just couldn't use it at all. That's, that's definitely something you want to consider staying away from as you uh, move forward. Um, Color-ish. Uh, the reason why I say this is because uh, there's something called color rendering. Um, with, which is important with light. And what that essentially is, is saying that we've lived under the sun for so long that we are hardwired to seeing color reflected from the light of the sun. Like that's our gold standard. Everything of the reds, the greens, the blues, the violets, the oranges, the yellows look best under the sun. And so we want to make sure that our light sources that have, that are reflecting 
off of those surfaces also render those colors in the same way to the sun. So the gold standard for any light lighting device is 100. I don't think there's anything, not even the incandescent is 100. Um, but anything in the 90s and up range is usually really good to understand that is close to the sun. And we're actually moving away from um, this whole color rendering index thing because it's not exactly accurate. It was good, but there's some better devices out there. But most LEDs, uh, if you want to hold up a tomato under certain LEDs, maybe it doesn't quite look so juicy and ripe. Maybe it looks a little bit like uh, it has been sitting on the shelf for too long. So that's something you want to work move away from. This is kind of what ends up, this is what it should look like, right? But sometimes it may end up looking like what's on the screen. We, we want to make sure that we are rendering color properly. Uh, next thing, with LEDs, because you're using the driver and you want to try to dim it, um, there's, there's a lot of that's happening there with the LED that sometimes when you want to try to turn the light on at a low level, it doesn't turn on at all because it needs a, a certain amount of energy to kick in for that low voltage side. Sometimes when you were bringing it down at a certain point, it just drops off altogether and just cuts out or it will only go down so far and it won't go any further. It's kind of like when you have the, the squeeze handle on a hose, you want to get just a little bit of water out without it shutting off on you and not too much water. And so trying to find that happy medium sometimes for the driver is, is, may not have the compatibility necessary to allow that light to dim fully down to its full capacity and start up and, and, and raise up to its full capacity. So you have to be aware of those dimming um, issues that, that can affect LEDs that do not have that same effect with an incandescent. Uh, next, hottish. Uh, if you notice uh, certain LEDs, they have, you know, all the light diodes on the one side of the surface and on the back, you've got all these, these metal fins or on, uh, if you've ever seen a, a LED downlight, you may find that there's something called a heat sink that's on the back. That's actually meant to pull heat away from the diode to, produce, to help uh, promote its, its life and its longevity. If you happen to have a light that doesn't really have a substantive heat sink on the backside, um, it's gonna tend towards getting hot. And then that will actually compromise the overall functionality of that light. So materials matter, uh, construction matters, design matters, the amount of materials matters that goes into the proper functioning and the longevity of a really good high quality product. So definitely worth considering the hottish side of maybe the, the, the cons related to some of the LEDs. Now, what are the pros? Uh, we have six pros that you should promote. <laughs> um, promoting, you wanna promote the fact that LEDs emerged in response to the fact that uh, when office buildings and energy consumption and residential buildings and their energy consumption were considered lighting and the heating loads that came from lighting all contributed to the energy consumption of the building because they needed to have more cooling to, to deal with all the heat that was coming off of incandescent lamps and whatnot. And so they, they wanted to move into being more energy efficient. Well, LEDs solve that problem in spades where um, just this morning I was buying a 60 watt equivalent light bulb that actually only consumed less than 10 watts. So what that means is the same amount of light that a 60 watt incandescent bulb would give off, uh, an LED bulb will give out that same amount of light at a fraction of the energy consumption on the inside. So from the, from the overall standpoint, Essentially, we have solved the energy problem by and large for how the, the LED fixtures can, can, can cut a ton, ton of energy consumption for, um, for projects. And, and so that's, that's one of the major reasons why we may have made and are continuing to make a push in the general direction of LED. Uh, another thing to think about is, is that LEDs are smallish. Um, if, you, if you doubt me on, on how powerful a really, really tiny LED is, like they can get those LEDs down to just two millimeters by two millimeters, super duper tiny. Um, but if you, if you doubt how powerful that is, just go down to your local hardware store and buy one of those miniature LED flashlights and then point it at your face and turn it on and you'll see what I mean. It is small, but it's powerful. But because it's small, that means that the light can be placed anywhere. 
Um, you can even put uh, like there are now lighting fixtures where there's just a single ring that is illuminated because you have all these little tiny LED diodes within that. And so you, it's allowing designers to reconfigure and, and, and understand so many more potential things that you can do with light that with an incandescent bulb and all the form factors of the incandescent bulb, you just simply couldn't do back in the day. So the smallishness of LEDs definitely is to its advantage. Another thing is, is oldish. Um, LEDs um, do, don't just flicker and, and die. Like the, the, there's no tungsten filament that just goes pop one day. Um, even if you shake an LED bulb, it's, it's not going, the LED is just going to be like, Haha, I love this. I can drive this out all day long. Whereas the tungsten filament is going to go, hey, that's, that's making me feel kind of restless here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break, I'm going to fall apart. The LED doesn't do that. And, and so as a result, it, it lasts a long time. There are LEDs that are rated for 20,000, 35,000 hours, which is like 10 years of use or 20 years of use. It's kind of like the difference between um, needing to buy 100 rolls of toilet paper in a year to meet your needs. And then now all of a sudden you can replace all 100 rolls with a single roll that will last an entire year. It's like completely changing the, 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 the face of of supply for LED fixtures. So the way a lot of manufacturers are getting around that to make you continue to buy bulbs all the time is to just limit the, the intelligence and the, the hardware on the, the driver side of things. So it's driver failure, not LED failure most times in those light bulbs, but they just dim over time. They don't just flicker and die. So something to think about, LEDs last forever. Uh, another thing, LEDs are coolish, right? Um, this is great for like certain kind of applications where um, the light that is emitted uh, needs to happen in a certain frequency so it doesn't fade materials and fabrics. Um, so a lot of times under most incandescent bulbs or halogen bulbs or MR16, um, they would emit light in the infrared frequency. And so for certain types of, of fabrics, it would actually cause those to fade. Um, LEDs do not emit light like that. And so it's going to have just a cool surface on, on the front surface of that LED, which is good for those applications. But let's say for traffic lights, where maybe you need to turn it on and you don't want to have, especially in New England, right? If you have a lot of wind and snow and ice blowing towards that traffic light, uh, that's, the light's not going to melt that snow off the front surface of that thing. So things to consider in that regard. But by and large, the fact that it's coolish is really good that the LED can function in that way. Right. Uh, another thing with LEDs, it's it's very precise-ish. If you've ever been under um, an LED light source uh, for traffic, as opposed to the old um, high-pressure sodium, high-pressure sodium is just like this big old bomb of like copper orange light everywhere. But LEDs are very cool, very crisp. The light that's coming out of them is, is channeled because of the optics. But because of the, the way the light is emitted, it allows that much greater level of control. And so it's very precise. Incandescents were not that way to the same extent. Uh, another thing with controlish, um, this, this is the thing that gets me the most excited. This favors um, everyone that's a part of the, the custom integration industry because of what you can do with the LED light itself. You can control it in ways that you never could control an incandescent bulb before. Uh, the, the greater amount of technology that's in the source is the greater amount of control that you have on the back end. If I just have a static white light, all I can do is increase the brightness and decrease the brightness. But if I have something that's fully digitally addressable, fully uh, tunable color, I can do all kinds of crazy things with that light itself. And that's something that, that incandescence can not, absolutely not come close to in reference to um, the LED. With the control side, a shout out to my good friend, David Bowie, back in the day, light control to Major Tom. Uh, we're going to talk about controls now and what makes the LED and the control of an LED so far superior and something that I think is really exciting. The precision I was talking about before, the precise-ish, you can, with the sophistication of, of the level of technology that's put on the inside of that device, you can dial in whatever it is that you want. If, if you're on, in a certain uh, setting and, and the light can do this, you're like, you know what? I wanna be stimulated right now. I want it to be brighter white light, boom. Brighter white light is done. Oh, I want my light to be um, a little bit warmer, a little bit more ambient right now, boom, that's done. Or if I have a, a special smart bulb uh, on the side of my face and I wanna say, you know what? I want pink right now, boom. I've got pink light all of a sudden on the side of my face, right? Like it can do that. It can be that precise. 
Um, and that's something that's kind of special from a controls perspective. Uh, something else with the white, the, like I was just mentioning, you can you can adjust the white up or down to get the right combination of white light within a given space to satisfy whatever your particular appetite is for light. A lot of friends that I have that are Indian, they love that daylight, 5,000 Kelvin white, white light that makes me feel kind of washed out in blue. Uh, but I prefer like more of the amber golden colors of 2,700K light. Uh, but but with the controls, you can you can adjust to whichever kind of preference somebody has for the white range. Um, that said, with the whole advent of the RGBW combination, you can also dial in any any particular color you want. In fact, I know of some manufacturers that have 16.7 million colors that you can dial in. And if my math is correct, if it takes 11 days to count to a million but by one second per number, 16.7 million is 16.7 times 11, which is what, maybe around 200 and some days. So if you start now when you dial in every single color that, that, that Ketra allows you to for every second of the day, I think probably by summer of next year, you have exhausted the full range of color options that you have available to you with, with that particular device. Not saying you should do it, but just saying knowing that you can is, is sometimes kind of an exciting thought. Um, another thing, let's say rendering. What, if I have, let's say, a, a beautiful portrait uh, of Monet on the wall that's got all these pinks and yellows and purples, I can actually adjust the color of the light to render that to its fullest potential. Or if I put up, let's say I've got uh, the blue riders uh, from the Greek expressionists on the wall as well, and they have some of these deep blue colors, I can adjust the light to accommodate that. Let's say I have gray granite or white marble um, for finishes in the house. I can dial in the color that I want to make sure that that is gonna look the very best that it can. And the controls of certain light fixtures that have sophisticated technology can do that for me. That's amazing. Next was intensity. Um, another thing that you can do with that is, is given to you with controls is you can dial in, let's say um, I wanna dial in a certain level of intensity of the light. I want it to be only so bright at certain times of the day. Or let's say that I'm in my 40s right now, and right now I need this level of light, right? When I'm in my 60s, I will need twice as much brightness to see with the same amount of visual acuity that I can see right now with less light. My kids that are younger than me, they need even less than half of what I currently need as far as light. So if they're reading in the dark and I'm like, you need to turn on some lights in here, they're like, no, I don't, I can see just fine. Whereas for me, I need to turn on every possible light in the space. With controls, you can dial in for a client who's say in their 40s right now, 80% of what the capacity of the light is. And then as they get older, you can ratchet it up to use the other 20% and have it be a brighter space so that people as they age in place have the opportunity to tap into the extra intensity that the control system would afford them for that particular project. Uh, and then finally, dimming. Like, you know, with, with an incandescent, when it dims, sometimes you hear like a little bit of a buzz, potentially, depending on, you know, if you have a good um, uh, dimmer or whatnot, uh, or just the way that the light works itself. Um, but, but if you can get down to like 10%, 5%, 1%, 0.1%, I know that Lutron for all of the, the lights that they have, they get everything can get down to 0.1% which is like if you could take a candle and you put a little dimmer switch on your candle and you actually can dial down your candle, um, it's even dimmer than a standard candle. It's like super duper dim, like barely enough to see as you're moving around to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night or you wanna have that romantic dinner um, and, and, and brighten the room with candles. You can just keep everything really low and chill with dimming and controls allow you to maintain that low level of dimming within the space. It's, it's amazing, it's fantastic. Uh, some other things like, uh, LEDs, because of their size, uh, because of, of how everything works, um, all the technology, all the bits and pieces of the whole thing can be hidden in plain sight. You don't even realize that, that there's a lot of sophistication going on where you have a linear tape light hidden in some recessed cove or behind some sort of door that's casting light in a space. And you can control all of that to allow the room to be illuminated rather than seeing a bunch of individual light sources that are being illuminated. Uh, the last thing that I as a lighting designer want to do to, um, pre predominantly like, is allow people to see 
into an actual source of light. I'm more interested in seeing what the light wants you to see rather than seeing the light itself. And LEDs uh, with the controls allow you to hide all of that in plain sight and allow the room and the architecture to speak more than the technology itself. And then finally, you know, the level of sophistication that's available. Um, you can, you like kind of summing this all up, people that are control freaks that just want to control everything, uh, dial things in, you can, you can set the LEDs with controls on a schedule to say, okay, at 8 a.m. I want this color of white light. At noon, I want this color of white light. At dinner time, I want this color of white light. And then at 9 p.m. when I'm getting ready for bed, I want this color of white light. And it automatically syncs to that schedule of the day or even can be uh, synced to the actual movement of the sun on that latitude and that longitude for that area so that there's a, a connection that you have still to the sun throughout the day that controls only can do for you. You're not just gonna stand by the wall and like, oh, it's 12 o'clock, you know, I need to go ahead and turn my incandescent light now down to this, this color. No, that all can happen automatically behind the scenes because controls allows you to bring that level of sophistication and detail to the entire experience. All of that's amazing stuff, right? All of that has been engineered and has been working in the, in the behind the scenes. And it's creating for us a new kind of future, a new way of conceiving how we illuminate our lives, how we bring light into the spaces, our intimate spaces, our public spaces, how we communicate about ourselves. And so this future is being held by somebody. Uh, we have future holders that are in this industry that are recognizing, hey, this is truly the future and we want to be a part of it. There are the old players like Lutron that's been doing controls forever. Uh, some of the ways that they're recognizing, hey, this technology is available. Let's go ahead and integrate things together. So they've, they've moved with Ketra and, and there's other players that are, you know, control systems uh, people and, and, and lighting manufacturers that are recognizing as the advent of LED, as the advent of smart lighting, as the advent of all these different technologies is popping off. They're retooling their entire industry model to focus on this, this emerging uh, market. Um, I know personally with for the custom integrator market, there's several manufacturers that are creating a specific channel just for integrators to purchase from them directly so that they can provide a product to the market within this new market segment. And so manufacturers are recognizing like, hey, we're getting behind this. We want to, to see where this is going. And so they're retooling themselves, right? Uh, there are also new players that are stepping in. Uh, some technology companies that like Samsung possibly are, are say, hey, we want to get into lighting. Or let's say um, there, there's, let's say I, I saw a report just the other day that said uh, within 2020 uh, that there was top 10 companies had over 50% of the entire market share of the smart lighting industry, which was already valued at over $20 billion just last year, right? It is only going to set to, to increase. No, I say 20, I mean, I think it was 12 billion, forgive me, $12 billion. And I think by 2025, that's going to double uh, as far as an overall market. And so smart lighting, and, and it's creating a whole new um, appetite for new players to emerge and to enter in. I know Savant is, is, is going on a tear right now where they buy GE, they, they've purchased USAI lighting. Uh, you've got other technology companies that are stepping in. Even mattress companies like Casper are investing in lighting. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, the, the Casper Glow. It's like a simple little light that you send to your bedside and you flip it over. Um, that has a certain amount of technology and it turns on and then it just gradually dims. And it's got all this really cool stuff on the inside for the purpose of, as they market it, a light that helps you go to sleep. And I, I got one for Christmas one year and I can promise you, I cannot last beyond the, the full range of dimming. I, it knocks me out like crazy, like, like a Mike Tyson punch in the jaw. It knocks me out. It works. But a mattress company is investing in lighting. They see the value of where LED technology is moving and they, in their way, are entering into that market. And then there's another group of people. Um, I call these you players. And I'm talking to you guys specifically. Um, this is truly a, a revolutionary moment in, 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 the, in the area of lighting. I tell people whenever I talk to them about why I'm so excited to do what I do, I'm telling them what's happening right now in the lighting industry is as significant to light 
as the electric bulb was to gaslighting back at the beginning of the 20th century. It's that significant. It is, it is moving us in a totally new and radical and significant direction. And so the invitation is on the table. Is this something that you guys want to be a part of? Because it's almost as if like the entire industry is saying, hey, wait a second, the technology and the need for controls for this advanced piece of technology is much more sophisticated than the average um, electrical contractor, even builders themselves to fully understand. It favors individuals who already have a capacity for technology to understand how the, all the kits of parts work, how all the electronics work on the inside to make it work. And so it's almost as if they're saying here, custom integration community, we need you to help us deliver this. And so the invitation is to you all, are you, are you gonna be a future holder as well? So my, my encouragement to you all is, hey, play on. It is gonna be challenging. There are gonna be roadblocks, um, but it is absolutely worth stepping on the field. Or as my friend says from India, he's, he calls the, the soccer field, the pitch, step onto the pitch uh, to use um, the, the, what is that game? Uh, you know, hit, hit the ball with a bat. That's a big flat bat. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, like to step on the pitch and, and get ready because this is the direction that things are moving. And we want to, to pass that invitation on to you as well. And I'm excited to be a part of it. And, and I can't see nothing, can't see anything but good things on the horizon for us. So that's, that's, my, that's my snack in our, I hope it was substantive. I hope it was tasty. Um, I hope it gave you good nourishment. Um, but, you know, that's it. Suzanne, I, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Hopefully I left uh, yeah, some time that, on the that, table. that was fantastic. That was a ton of information. So if anyone's head is spinning a little bit, that's okay. Um, what, for all of the information that you just put out there, yeah. how can any of the folks on this call take it, boil it down, and now present information over to their homeowners to say, I am an expert. I know how to lead you down this path. How, how do they start that? Um, I think, honestly, it's, it's really a simple question. How important is, is lighting to you? Do you know that lighting has changed and, and it has undergone a significant transformation? You know, if you're not aware of that, can I, can I help you see what's now available to you that wasn't available to the previous generation? You know, starting with that first, a basic awareness and education, um, so that it's, it's more of an informative kind of thing, I think is important uh, because once you as an individual start to peel back the layers of all that's gone into the infrastructure of these devices, you'll start to recognize, wow, this is, this is something totally new. This is something totally exciting. It's, it's really intimidating. Uh, and so I want to position myself by educating myself to be able to say, I can confidently uh, support saying this is something that you that you ought to consider putting in putting in your home um and and myself my team my lighting sherpa we're all here to help guide you through that process to make sure that the right light is chosen it's put in the right place to do the right thing to support uh, your needs in the home um and i also i do want to open it up to questions from anybody else um i don't see any that have come in uh, we did have one request earlier on um if the recordings are available for last week um and they are um if uh, i know jeff rogers may have put the link into the chat but we can also get you a link to it so please reach out to your account managers and we can get you the link of last week as well as this week when it is available um and the the intent of all of these sessions is we're, we're kind of leading up to um an in-person presentation that we're gonna be doing um, in October. You'll see more information come out from this um, from the Strateris team. Um, so this is gonna be an event that we're doing in Connecticut um, the week of October 19th. So please keep an eye on your emails and Bruce will be there in person um, doing trainings. So bring your questions, bring your passion, bring your excitement because um, Bruce has a lot of knowledge uh, to share for everybody. Um, so we'll leave it open for a little bit if anybody has any questions, but thank you all so much for your time today. Bruce, thank you. This has been an absolutely amazing presentation. 
I, I, I can't tell you how many texts I've been getting from people just saying, this is awesome. Good. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. I, I, I'm just as stoked and excited about what's happening in this exchange as well. And if you thought this one was good next week, I, I, I think it may actually get a little bit better because we're going to start peeling back uh, a deeper, more fundamental human reason why lighting is even more important beyond technology. So tune in. All right. But thank you all for joining. But I said, if you have any questions, we'll hang on for questions. But thank you all so much. Thanks, everybody.